I think it's time to fly. Uh, everybody, you got the audio, everybody. Diane, hello. Eleanor, dear. Dan is hiding out. <laughs> With the, the guy who's looking out to see there. Mm -hmm. He helped me buy my car. He's like a car whisperer. Yeah. But <laughs> I was talking about like, I need a car. It was a couple of years ago, it was in 2020. And he, you know, I've known him for years from Spirit Rock. He was like, oh, I can help you find what you want. <laughs> well, I, 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 just tell me what you want. I knew a guy. <laughs> I know. He, he is the guy. <laughs> so thanks, Dan, even though you're not showing your face. I bought that car, by the way. It, it was a lease. <laughs> I leased it. I just bought it last month. So I'm still thinking of you. All right, kids. It is, uh, what, Thursday? It's in April. It must be like, what, the 17th? 18th. 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 So when was, so tax day was Monday? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's James Barris's birthday, too, if anybody knows James. So I always remember, oh, it's James' birthday. I'll send him a text to talk to the April 15th. Otherwise, I wouldn't remember. Anyway, uh, this is going to be a good evening. There he is. Hey, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, man. Um, we're going to go through the April path tonight, and I'm excited about that. Uh, I mean, you know, these are the things that excite me. <laughs> Talk about the April path. Uh, but it is, it's a beautiful, beautiful topic. And, um, and each time I, I return to these uh, areas of the Dharma, there's always something fresh and alive for me. And I, I think that's what, um, you know, what's beautiful about spiritual path is that because our mind and our mind states are constantly changing, our perception is constantly changing. So that just like the way people read the big book and they go, I've read that a hundred times and I never noticed that. It's the same thing with the Dharma. So, uh, so this will be enjoyable. I was reflecting this afternoon. So, but we will begin with the sitting, and this sitting will, unless I once again lose track of time, will last approximately thirty minutes. Uh, for which time I'll be speaking for some some part of it, at least the first half of it, depending upon how you know inspired I am or annoying I am. I know some people like to just sit in silence and then some people will like to have somebody guiding them. And so as a, I'm not codependent, <laughs> but I do want everybody to be happy. <laughs> There's a difference, I just say. So I kind of split the difference by talking for a while and then letting it, uh, I, once I'm quiet, I won't interrupt it and jump in because that can be really startling, you know, when it's like been eight, nine minutes of just silence. And it's like, what are you noticing right now? <laughs> My heart is beating really fast. <laughs> so uh, that's what my first teacher used to do that a lot. So <laughs> we learn from our teachers and we learn to not be our teachers too. So there's both. <laughs> All right, so just settling into your sitting posture, whatever that might be for you. And just then close your eyes or just lower your gaze if you prefer to. Keep your eyes a little bit open. And turning the attention to the feeling of your body. Just the general feeling of sitting. 
noticing the balance and alignment of your body. And just noticing as well your energy right now. Are you alert and bright or, or dull or tired? Did your day create stress or did it leave you feeling settled or, or peaceful? Or perhaps it's just more of a neutral feeling. There's no distinct quality to how you're feeling. Our energy is very important in meditation. We can be restless and have too much energy or sleepy with not enough energy. Then there's also the level of what we can call emotional energy. It's helpful to tune into that as well or check in with that. How are you feeling right now? You don't have to put a name on it or label it, but just attune how you're feeling. All of this, in a sense, is setting, setting the scene for your meditation, understanding that your meditation will be informed and affected by these different aspects of body and mind, mood. Of course, when we meditate, we try to bring forth and cultivate positive qualities, qualities of clarity and calm, openness, loving kindness. And sometimes those things arise and sometimes they don't. So we don't want to set up expectations or judgments about what should happen. But if, for instance, we had some conflict that's still resonating inside from the day. And we might have to sit with that rather than immediately feeling a lot of loving kindness. So this is the setting the scene that I'm speaking of, just to recognize that there is a set of conditions that we begin with. And there are intentions that we try to move toward. But at the end of the day, we're not in control. So with all that, let's start to focus on the breath. Feel the breath at the nostrils, just the touch of air coming in and out. 
You can follow the breath. The belly and diaphragm. As they expand and contract, rise and fall. But take a little time to attune to the breath. If the mind wanders, just come back. Thinking is the natural behavior of the mind, what the mind does. Our practice involves noticing that, accepting that, and over and over letting go and coming back sensations of breath. It can be helpful to notice what themes are present in your thinking right now? Often what shows up in meditation is what's been going on in the back of your mind, sometimes unconsciously. And as you create space and quiet, it's an opportunity for these underlying concerns to appear, come to the fore. These thoughts can be very compelling. Can seem to demand our attention. They might seem very important. What's most helpful in terms of mindfulness meditation is to just feel that pull to think. You are feeling mental desire. Like any form of desire, it promises something. 
promises some satisfaction. If you just think about this enough, it tells you something will be solved. Something will be resolved. But in fact, following that pull only creates an ongoing process, just creates more thinking. Mm -hmm. One desire triggering the next desire. Mm -hmm. So our practice is to let go.
Well, can I get? Uh -huh. We're meditating in all sorts of places. How are you doing? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, it's been fun coming over here. I really appreciate being, I, when I say over here, I mean, I live in Berkeley, so over the bridge, you know, over the bay. Uh, but, um, uh, Really nice. I appreciate Noam and, and Jimmy getting in touch and inviting me and being able to be part of this community again. I hope that, uh, you know, we'll make, make this a, a regular thing. Um, and so, you know, where we're, this is, you know, of course, about recovery and Buddhism. And, um, and I've for those who have been, like guess just about all of you have been with us this whole time. We've been going through the Four Noble Truths and the, the core teaching of Buddhism, the truth of suffering, the cause of suffering, craving, and the, the end of suffering, the cessation, and then the way to the end of suffering. So, uh, so last week we talked a lot about craving and and letting go and and this uh so this week i want to talk about the eightfold path uh which is just you know again as i was saying before you know the the more i keep coming back to these teachings the more inspiring i find them and this is to me the best book on the noble eightfold path by Bhikkhu Bodhi, and that's the name of it. A very short and packed. Uh, this is, uh, again, one of those books you can just read over and over. Um, and it, and Bhikkhu Bodhi is a scholar as well as being a you know, devoted practitioner and writer. And, and I think he had a PhD in philosophy from Claremont Colleges, but in any case, he's he's very smart. And when you read him, you're like a little need the dictionary there. Uh, but, and, you know, so his his language is very high. <laughs> but one of the things I like about that is it forces me to go slow when I read it. You know, I have to like stop and, uh, and take apart the things. And, and this. This opening, it's just the preface to this book, is uh, just a really valuable couple of paragraphs. So I'm going to start by reading some of this, and then I'll then I'll talk. The essence of the Buddhist teaching can be summed up in two principles: the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. The first covers the side of doctrine. And the primary response it elicits is understanding. The second covers the side of discipline in the broadest sense of that word. And the primary response it calls for it is practice. In the structure of the teachings, these two principles lock together into an indivisible unity called the Dhamma Vinaya, the doctrine and discipline, or in brief, the Dhamma. The internal unity of the Dhamma, so Dhamma is the Pali for Dharma, that's... The internal unity of the Dhamma is guaranteed by the fact that the last of the Four Noble Truths is the... I'm sorry, I look up the truth. The last of the Four Noble Truths, the truth of the way, is the Noble Eightfold Path. Well, the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, right view, is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Thus, the two principles penetrate and include one another. The formula of the Four Noble Truths containing the Eightfold Path and the Noble Eightfold Path containing the Four Truths. So that in itself is a good thing to understand. 
And, you know, you should get this book and read that paragraph a couple of times. <laughs> So, but also, as we go through this, you know, you'll see what, it, as we go through the Eightfold Path, we'll kind of get to that connection. Given this internal unity, it would be pointless to pose the question, which of the two aspects of the Dhamma has greater value, the doctrine or the path? But if we did risk the pointless by asking that question, now, Bhikkhu Bodhi is funny. But this is not like, you know, stand-up comedy funny. But I find that pretty funny. It would be pointless, but if we were going to... All right, sorry. But if we did risk the pointless by asking that question, which of the two aspects is of greater value, the doctrine of the discipline, the answer would have to be the path. The path claims primacy because it is precisely this that brings the teaching to life, just like the 12 steps. The path translate the, translates the Dhamma from a collection of abstract formulas into a continually unfolding disclosure of truth. It gives an outlet from the problem of suffering with which this teaching starts, and it makes the teaching's goal, liberation from suffering, accessible to us in our own experience where alone it takes on authentic meaning. To follow the Noble Eightfold Path is a matter of practice rather than intellectual knowledge. But to apply the path correctly, it has to be understood. In fact, right understanding of the path is itself a part of the practice. It is a facet of right view, the first path factor the forerunner and guide for the rest of the path. Thus, though initial enthusiasm might suggest that the task of intellectual comprehension may be shelved as a bothersome distraction, mature consideration reveals it to be quite essential to ultimate success in the practice. So this last idea is kind of where I want to start, which is to say that you know, when I encountered Buddhism, it was like about meditation. And I was just, I was going to meditate and that everything was going to be revealed through the meditation. And I was going to be transformed and fixed through the meditation. And I didn't need anything else. That is not, <laughs> you know, the proper way to think. If you don't understand what you're doing, you can't really get the most out of it. There's benefit to just meditating. It's useful, absolutely. But when you understand it and what, and you understand the path, then you're able to get so much more out of it. Just a critical idea. And this is why I really, really encourage you all to study particularly the Eightfold Path. It's, there's eight, which first of all, is a lot to try to learn. And each of those has a sub list so that when you add it all up, you're going to get up more like 30. You know, it's a lot. So, but this isn't about like, oh, I'm going to go and memorize that stuff. It's about keep coming back to these, keep asking yourself, what is that? What's, what can I understand about this? What can I understand? You know, what, what, and, and if, you, if you stay engaged, especially in your practice and, and hearing Dharma talks and reading, you'll keep coming to these questions like, well, that teacher was talking about right view, but I don't quite understand that. Let me go back and look at Bhikkhu Bodhi. Let me look at Joseph Goldstein. Let me, you know, uh, and... And you'll find that as your practice progresses and your study progresses, things start to come together in ways that are very, very inspiring. And, and, and that's where the real transformation happens. So I want to, but I want to introduce you, and I know many of you have, you know, looked, probably even have this book or studied the, Dharma and, and know a lot of this, but I want to start 
with uh, a, a, like the simplest formula for the Eightfold Path so that if it's new to you, or even if it's something that you know, you've know you reflected on, but that you'll have this framework that you can always come back to. And it only involves three things. And I think we can hold three things a lot easier than eight. So the three things are the three major areas that the Eightfold Path covers. And I'm going to try to put them in terms that, you know, for a moment, we could put aside some sort of Buddhist terms and just get to sort of ordinary language. So the first section as a, the, uh, in terms of foundational practice is the area on behavior. And this is includes morality, but it's, both, it's about behavior. So for addicts, we understand like behavior is really important, but it, without that, all your lofty ideas don't go anywhere if you're still drinking and using, because lots of us did all kinds of spiritual things when we were still drinking and using and did maybe good things in the world. Maybe we're working for a nonprofit or we're protesting nuclear, you know, power or whatever, you know, but as long as we had these underlying behaviors, yeah, uh, and we never really got on track or we kept going off track. So behavior, really important area. And, and I'm gonna go through each of these in detail, but, uh, but to start, behavior, and then the training the mind, mental training. So this is the inner life, the inner world. And it, it, of course it's meditation, but it's more than that. It's, it's really, you know, there's a lot of work we have to do with our minds. <laughs> You know, I mean, because it's not, you know, the, the therapy isn't in the Eightfold Path, but, you know, it's kind of like you know, a useful thing to include in there. So mental training. And then understanding how you understand reality, how you understand the world, you know. So because that that way, the way of understanding the world influences everything else like your behavior is largely determined by how you understand the world like if you think that the way the world works and what makes you happy so when i say what the way it work, the world works partly is what i'm saying is what makes you happy or what's the purpose of life if you if what you think the purpose of life and what makes you happy is to get a lot of money and a lot of power and control then your behavior is going to be oriented in a certain way and your mind is going to operate in a certain way. And by definition, by the Buddhist definition, if you are driven by those things, greed and power, you are going to suffer. So it's very important how, you know, if you meditate a lot, but you still have this perspective of power and control, what you're going to be doing is trying to control your mind. You know, you're going to be trying to create experience like, oh, what I really want to have is to have those bliss experiences I heard about because you're trying to you're grasping, right? The ordinary way of thinking. So understanding is critical. So behavior, mental training and understanding perspective. So these are the three elements of the path. They all interact just as I was describing, like they don't they don't they're not sufficient alone they're all useful alone it's great you know like having an understanding like a lot of people like they read about zen and they're like oh man like i i, I get it it's you know uh, really everything is empty you know i'm just like wow but meanwhile you know they don't meditate so their minds are just like <laughs> or their you know behavior is not wholesome and you know why can't i ever get a relationship that works mm, well what are you looking for sex oh well you know that will work for a little while, but, uh, you know, no. So, so uh, you know, be, all of these things need to be in place in order to fulfill the Dharma. And what's the purpose? I mean, interesting, just to look at the Eightfold Path. It's the Eightfold Path. I mean, I'm sorry. Chick, chick, the Four Noble Truths. Let's go back to the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are about cause and effect or karma. They're about 
the cause of suffering, you know, the, the, the craving causes suffering, cause and effect. Letting go causes the end of suffering, cause and effect. So what the Eightfold Path is training is training you to let go. Critical idea that often gets lost, again, because we live in a world that values control. And, and you know, when you are told that, you know, the way to the end of suffering is to let go, the first thing you think is, well, how can I do that? And right away, you're caught. Mm -hmm. How can I do the negative? How can I do letting go? It's sort of, you can't do letting go, right? Letting go is non-doing. Well, how do I non-do? <laughs> uh, this is kind of the paradox. It's really the challenge of the practice. So these three, so I, I want you to just keep those three components. If, if there's nothing else you remember from tonight, if you can remember behavior and mental training and understanding, uh, that, that'd that be, I'd be happy. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'll be happy, I'll be okay. Don't do it for me. <laughs> but that's what I, that's what I wanna connect. <clears throat> But as I said, so the, the the three add up to eight. So obviously there's two threes and one two in there, but the math is not that smooth. Um, but as I said, each of the each of those elements then has subcategories, and that's where we really learn about the Dharma. Because just like the 12 steps, the Eightfold Path is about practice. It's about doing something. It's not intellectual. You know, it's, as, as Bhikkhu Bodhi says, it's, that's, it's about practice. And, you know, if someone says, well, you should develop right action. Well, you could go, well, okay, that's great, but what's, what's that mean? <laughs> So then you look and, okay, right action is traditionally the, the five precepts. And now we've got another list. He said, don't kill, don't steal, don't harm sexually, don't lie, don't use intoxicants. So that's a great, like, guideline for living, right? And each of those can be reflected on quite a bit. You know, what does it mean? Again, what does it mean to not kill? Does that mean... I have to be a vegetarian. It's a question that's been asked for a long time. Well, I'm not going to tell you what what's right. I don't know. If, to not steal, does that include being 100% honest on my taxes? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess. I don't know. Um, and down the line, and, and you know, the fifth precept, to not use intoxicants. It's so interesting that you run into a lot of Buddhists who are very fundamentalist about the other precepts. Like, <laughs> you not, you not, may not kill an ant, <laughs> but it's okay to have a glass of wine with dinner. And I mean, an occasional acid trip is, is spiritual. So, okay. I'm, that's your program. That's your that's your practice, and you know, and uh, you know there are things I do. I, well, the truth is, I'm not a vegetarian, but I consider that to be breaking the precept. I think that I think the precept does mean that you you shouldn't eat meat, but I do, and I and so I I just say, okay, I'm I'm willing to accept the karma of that, rather than, you know, the argument like, oh, no, it's okay, that's not really, you know, because there's a whole thing about, uh, I mean, this is this is re how religion works, right? <laughs> this is what they say. A monk can eat meat, but only if it wasn't killed for him. 
I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> that's perfect. You know, that's like some kind of, I grew up a Catholic, you know, we had a lot of stuff like that, you know, it's just like very convenient. <laughs> no. Uh, so, uh, so I, you know, I have my own understanding what the precepts mean, you know, and, and I also accept that I'm not, I don't practice them perfectly. So then I practice self-forgiveness, self-compassion, and acceptance of the karmic consequences. Try to. So that's how I think about the precepts. Not like, oh, this is the right way of understanding them, and I, I do them right. You know, it's like, eh, I don't know. This is how I understand it. I mean, there's a lot of people these days using plant medicine now. I'm not, uh, you know, I've learned to say that. <laughs> so that you know people will think that I you know, whatever and you know I think they're breaking the precept and but that's okay you know what I meant like I'm not I'm not saying they're going to go to hell unless you know Sometimes you take plant medicine and you go to hell, but it's temporary. <laughs> but it's been hard. I, I have to say, it's been hard as a person in my role who practices abstinence from drugs and alcohol to be confronted with the, this idea that, oh, you know, psilocybin can be, or, you know, this. Uh, Ibogaine, it's a great way to get off drugs. I'm always like, yeah, just what people are looking for, a drug to help them quit drugs. You know? Sounds very American. <laughs> but, you know, what do I know? You know, It's like, that's not my karma. It's their karma. I, 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 it... So I, I, I'm, I've been tr I try to stay out of that conversation. I usually fail, but, but I, I think... Um, you know, we have to solve this. We just have to solve this for ourselves and and not go by, you know, something in a book or something, you know, we have to, we have to sense for ourselves what works. So that's just one aspect of the Eightfold Path, right? So the other elements of, of the behavioral realm are right speech, which is, Again, just an area of practice that takes devotion and commitment and uh, willingness. Uh, that's just really challenging. You know, I've heard it said that in the monasteries, the precept that's broken the most is the precept on right speech. You know, gossiping, get anger, judgment. And so, you know what? I always love when the, the bells are in here. It's great. Don't have bells in Berkeley, you know? This, God doesn't come over there. <laughs> if you ever go to an AA meeting over there, it's the most. <laughs> and not that I believe in God, but uh, anyway, that's uh, it's not me and for God. We don't have to worry about it. <laughs> One thing that quickly becomes apparent when you start to go through these elements of the Eightfold Path is that in order to fulfill any of these aspects of the path, you must be mindful. You must be aware. So right speech depends upon right mindfulness. You can't, you can't notice what you're saying until you're, unless you're aware. You can't notice what you're doing unless you're aware. I was thinking la last night, um, I was noticing that I, that I was being mindful, but I, I wasn't really, um, it's hard to explain. I, I, guess, I guess I was remembering that there were times when I used to be intoxicated, but I was aware that I, I was, I was mindful, but it wasn't right mindfulness. So it's interesting that, that there's, that you can be 
mindful, meaning like I would be aware, like I'm walking through the bar, like walking to the stage to pick up my guitar. And I'm like, oh, wow, I can feel myself walking. Like I'm really practicing mindfulness because I was had been doing mindful mindfulness before I got sober. So I'd be like, yeah, I'm drunk, but I'm I'm aware. But that's not actual mindfulness. Uh, it's just being aware. So it's you know we can see there's again like these subtle distinctions. Well, in that case, it's not so subtle when you're drunk, but. Um, but you need to be able to apply any of these elements. You have to be mindful. You need to be present for the experience. And then the third aspect of the, the behavioral element is right livelihood, which implies more than just your job, uh, but really how you, how you use your energy in the world, what you devote your time and energy to. You know, again, I, I, I you know, my my uh, wife went out of town on uh, Tuesday, and that, that I saw it day before yesterday. And yeah, yesterday I found myself, at, like later in the day, kind of adrift, and my mind going into some of the less wholesome places that it tends to go when I'm adrift, and I'm not really and. and I realized that like the container of our relationship in our home and the, just the container of it, like is part of my refuge, part of what like kind of keeps me on track. It's not like, oh, she's going to say something. If I, it's not like that. It's not like there's a pressure, but it's like this natural flow and structure. And then when I had like, oh, that, so like this morning, I was like, oh, you know what? Like I should actually like, if I have like extra time and space in my day, I should maybe do more meditation <laughs> or some reading <laughs> rather than letting my head go into the dark places. And it's just so easy, just so interesting to see how quickly, uh, you know, the unrestrained mind goes into those unwholesome places. Um, it's, you know, the monastic life, which, you know, I kind of watch monks and I have, I think of them as friends, but I guess teacher and some sort of friend monks and how their life is, it's very structured. And it's, it's for this reason. It's to keep them out of trouble. It's not because they are so enlightened that they're just floating through their day. And, you know, it's, this is like to keep them awake and aware and conscious. Like, no, no, no time wasting watching TV, you know, no time wasting, you know, having four meals or three meals a day, you know, no, no wasting time playing golf, you know, or whatever, you know, you do that. And, uh, you know, that's, a, it's a good model. It's a good reminder. I mean, it's like when somebody comes into AA, the first thing people tell them is, you should go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And it's creating this structure, this safe place for people so that they won't go into those negative places, right? It's, it's, it's not complicated. And it's kind of like, you know, we're like children, you know? I mean, when do you stop being a child? Uh, I, I, in my mind, every age that you have been, you still have that in you. I mean, you don't, if you're not, if you haven't gotten to 80 yet, you don't have 80 in you. But if you've been through 5, 10, 15, you know, you, you still have that in you, right? And we can go, we can fall into that, you know, depending upon how whatever, disciplined or uh, evolved or whatever we are, you know. And, and I think, here's a theory for you, instant theory, that we each have like an age that we tend to regress to, you know. And that's kind of our go-to place when 
things kind of break down when we're tired or we're upset or you know depressed or something. We kind of go to that. Oh yeah, twelve. Oh yeah, seventeen. Mm, oh yeah, five. You know, and maybe there's trauma, and I'm not going to get you know. I'm not a therapist. So how we use our time, right? Livelihood. So then the, we start with behavior because that's how we create a life that's sane, you know, and that, that kind of is functional so that we're not agitated all the time. And then we can start to do mind training, the, the meditation aspect, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. When right effort, we can see, is tied directly to the Four Noble Truths as well. The effort to avoid unwholesome states that have not arisen. So don't let craving arise if it's not there. Keep, keep, you know, keep yourself protected. The effort to abandon unwholesome states that have arisen. That's kind of the main aspect of our practice, one of the two main aspects, I'd say. Let go. Oh, this thought, this feeling, this words, something unwholesome, unhelpful is showing up. Let me let it go. That's the first two, focusing on the unwholesome. The second two, so this is, this is by the way, this is the, the list of effort, right? So as I said, every one of the eight, factors as a list, a sub-list. So we work with the unwholesome, then we work with the wholesome, the effort to cultivate wholesome states that have not arisen. So when we sit down to meditate, whatever mood you're in, it's like, well, what I'm trying to do is cultivate some calm, maybe some loving kindness, some clarity, right? Those are the wholesome states that I'm trying to cultivate by meditating. It's not... It, even though it's sort of a, a funny way of describing it, like uh, when I first encountered these four aspects of right effort, I was like, well, that seems very mechanical. But when it comes down to it, oh, yeah, it does point to all the things that we're doing. I'm meditating in order to let go of the unhelpful stuff and to cultivate some of the helpful stuff. And then once I've cultivated the effort to maintain it, you know, that's a lot what our recovery program is about, is maintaining it. And then, so that's effort. And then mindfulness, which, you know, obviously we can spend, you know, many, many classes just talking about mindfulness. So this quality, the, the word that I've started to use more and more is attunement. Attunement to my experience. Attunement to my body, attunement to the feelings that arise, attunement to the mental states, attunement to awareness itself, and then finally attunement to wisdom, to reality, to the you know the kind of overarching elements of reality, which this is kind of going to be a lot of the theme next week, which is impermanence, suffering, and not self. So, so mindfulness starts as a very personal thing, really being connecting with your body to your breath, you know, what your internal life, the feelings that show up, and the thoughts that show up. But then we step out and try to see all that in an impersonal way, to see that it's just processes unfolding, to see that it's everything is in constant flux, that it's not, that there is no central core to it. And that when we get caught in things, that that's when the suffering arises. And if we can keep those things in mind, and this is really about understanding the other element then we keep ourselves from falling into those unwholesome mind states.
And then the, the third aspect of the mind training is the development of concentration, which is sustaining the attention. And the concentration has, you know, a, a variety of aspects to it. It's, it's the quality of meditation that makes meditation pleasant. When you're when you're sitting and you kind of hit that like ah, whether it's for one breath or for five minutes or you know for a, a week, that's that's the manifestation of, or it's the outcome of of concentration. So concentration isn't even really a good word for. Um, it's for samadhi, you know, and and I think a lot of there's kind of this uh, transition before full concentration called tranquility, which I think is what most of us get to experience. Uh, it's these are like technical terms, and I've actually been like mm, kind of trying to sort out sometimes thinking. I think that a lot of what I think of as concentration is actually tranquility, so I don't know. But the importance of concentration is that it helps us, allows us to sustain our attention long enough to see things. Like if you're just mindful for a moment, you can't see that everything's constantly changing. Because in a given moment, you're not really seeing a lot of change. But when you can sustain your attention, then you can start to see all these things play out. And it also allows you to look more and more closely. Um, you know, and, and it, it largely depends upon time. You know, although there are certainly meditative practices and forms of meditation that are more conducive to concentration. What they all depend upon is time. It's just sitting and being still and repetition and kind of grinding down the busyness of the mind until it finally gets still. I know, uh, it, you know, the thing that started me on this path of teaching the Dharma with recovery was primarily the idea of teaching people in recovery to meditate. Because there it was in step 11 in the 12 steps, but very few people actually understood what meditation was. And what I, what I felt and sensed, or maybe I should just say believed, was that not many people were getting the kind of serenity that the deep meditation can give, even though that word was very out front in the recovery world, you know, the serenity prayer. And, but their serenity seemed more based on the fact that they weren't, you know, screwing up anymore. So they weren't going crazy, but, but the kind of peace uh, that you can get through Buddhist meditation, through any meditation, but certainly Buddhism is a great system, provides great systems of meditation. Uh, that, that it seemed to me was lacking and, um, and that's something that uh, I think is invaluable. Because once you taste that, you have a connection, you have a sense of life. You know, when you, when you experience concentration and mindfulness together deeply, you are more alive, more conscious than you ordinarily can be. And it doesn't mean that you have to be in any kind of an altered state, but just be you know, in a meditation retreat and step outside 
look at the sky, look at the grass, just feel the air, and there's an aliveness there. Uh, it's one of the things that really, really, uh, not not just set me on this path, but made me feel that this was the path, you know, encountering that experience of aliveness. So the, and the, the third component, so we talked about behavior and mind training, and the third component of the Eightfold Path that I called understanding. And there are technical terms for each of these areas. I'll, maybe I'll mention them, and I know many of you know them already. But the, 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 there are two, just two uh, aspects of the path left. So one is right view, which Bhikkhu Bodhi mentions, and the other one is right intention. A right view, even before you get into the technical description of it, which can be helpful, but you know, but to understand that like there's a way of looking at things that's correct <laughs> and right, maybe right isn't the best word. That's that's uh, more more authentic, more real. And then there's like ways of looking at things that are misunderstandings, uh, misapprehensions. They are not really real. So in, in the addiction world, we, call, we talk about denial. Well, that's wrong view, right? It's not seeing reality. So to, to understand like, oh, it's important for me to like look at the world without rose-colored colored glasses, you know, to like look at what, what is really true and what, what am I just telling myself? And this is a really difficult thing to get straight because, uh, the, first of all, the ordinary human way of looking at the world is wrong view. Right? It, the ordinary way of looking at the world is if I can just get everything I want, then I'll be happy. You know, uh, you know simplify it, but kind of what it is, and that's the opposite of, of right view. Right view is if I can just let go of everything, then I'll be happy. Right? Well, what? That doesn't make any sense. So, so we're so deeply conditioned. This is why we have to keep practicing. It's like, you know, the parallel is like, I'm an alcoholic. That's why I have to keep going to meetings. I mean, sure, I haven't had a drink in 20 years or 30 years, but that conditioning. You know, and this isn't true for everybody, but there are a lot of people who sense that or feel that. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go have a drink this afternoon if I don't go to a meeting this morning. But it's just that I sense this, you know, to use the Buddhist term, unwholesome, <laughs> unhelpful quality energy within myself that kind of tends to just kind of pull me off the path. You know, and I just have to keep coming back. And so with with the Buddha Dharma, I need to meditate regularly. I need to listen to the Dharma. I need to study the Dharma. I need to engage with my community on a regular basis to keep myself from going into those habitual ways of being. So the the you know, as as Bhikkhu Bodhi talked about, the one of the aspects of right view is seeing the Four Noble Truths. So right view, seeing things clearly and correctly, is seeing that there is suffering, that there's a cause of suffering, which is craving, and that you can end suffering by letting go of craving, and that if you practice the Eightfold Path, that's how you will let go. <laughs> so that, again, is something we just kind of have to keep in mind, like, what oh, What am I supposed to be doing? And that's why, for me, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, I don't need any other Dharma talks. Like, I love it. I love, to, like, in the Thai forest tradition, mostly what they talk about is those two things. Yeah. The other aspect of right view, which is directly tied, as I described it in here, is to see cause and effect to understand cause and effect, to understand the law of karma, to understand that everything that you think, say, or do has repercussions. 
and that those repercussions are directly related to the, the quality of those repercussions, the quality of what happens is informed by the quality that you bring into that action. So, makes sense. So, so it's a, it means if you act out of greed, you get the karma that happens out of greed. If you act out of love, you get the karma that comes out of love. There's not a, like, you can't, like, sign up for, okay, if I'm nice to them, they'll, they'll be nice to me. Or if I give money to them, then I'm going to win the lottery. It's not, you know, it's not so simplistic like that. It's a, it's more energetic, you know. But what it is definitely not is, and does not allow for, is magical thinking. And that's what's really important to me. You know, the law of karma is like, no, that happened for a reason. It's God did not get me to park in place out front, by the way, we were talking, you know, I showed up at five minutes to six when the yellow spots become legal to park in. And so the timing cause and effect was that, you know, and there aren't as many cars on 24th Street as there are, you know, in Pacific Heights, you know, so anyway. So the final piece of this, the eight factors, so right view and right intention. So right, you can see, because I've been just was talking about intention, that right intention is tied to right view. If you if you see things accurately, you will act wisely. If you see things inaccurately, you will act unwisely, right? If you if you have wrong view, you will have right wrong action. You will have the wrong intention. And it's the intention behind the action that creates the energetic impact of that action. It's what creates the whole tonality of that action and the results of that action. There are three aspects to right intention. This is your last list. <laughs> but the first one is so important because the first aspect of right intention is, as Bhikkhu Bodhi in his language is renunciation. Well, in ordinary spiritual language, it's letting go. So the three intentions are letting go, acting out of loving kindness, and acting out of compassion. Now, when I say acting, it's really important. This is another thing that I have to repeat a lot because I forget it. And so I assume other people forget it because I don't think I'm that odd. <laughs> there are three kinds of action, thoughts, words, and deeds. So our thoughts have karmic effect. I mean, you know, the Dhammapada famously begins by saying that the mind is the forerunner of all things, or everything comes out of the mind. Everything starts with the mind. You know, before I came over here today, I thought, I'm going to go over there. <laughs> you know, and then I got like, if I didn't think or have the intention to come here, I couldn't get here. It wouldn't happen without that. that the intention has to be there. So intention is so critical. It's the thing that everything depends upon in terms of our lot, how our lives unfold. But that first intention, the intention of let intention of letting go, again, so challenging because we're so conditioned to like try to get things. And, and we translate it into the spiritual world as well. You know, I was on a retreat in the fall, a longer retreat. And, and with my psychic abilities, I was able to determine that many of the people in that retreat were practicing in order to get high, you know, and not literally, but, but, but what they were trying to do was get into these states. And the way I, of course, I don't, don't have psychic abilities. I, you know, I hope you knew that that was... I don't know if it was humor, but it was something. <laughs> but I'm pretty good at observing meditators now, 
after 40 years of practicing. And you can sort of see by the way people walk around a meditation center, what's going on with them energetically. And when they're creeping around in this way that's like, looks like they're afraid that they might lose their samadhi for a second if they step too quickly, you start to sense that they're trying, they're trying to hold on to something. And, and them aside, it's very common. I, I know I've done it, that we're meditating and we get into a pleasant state. Once you learn to get into a pleasant state meditating, it's hard to have a motivation to do more. But that's not the end. That's only the concentration part. That's not insight. And so you develop that. And really, for, for years, that was what I thought meditation was for. And I didn't maybe, I didn't think it. I just sort of felt it. And it's a very tricky thing to, to meditate without trying to uh, get it without grasping after a pleasant state and without trying to hold on to a pleasant state that you cultivated. So here's a formula that I came up with. Effort without right intention inclines toward grasping. So if you're making an effort, but you're not making an effort toward letting go, you're going to be trying to get something, and that we know causes suffering. Concentration without right intention inclines toward clinging, because you get concentrated, and then you hold, you know, okay, I've got my mind stable, you know, it's really quiet in here, this is great, I love this, I'm just going to keep doing this all day. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't leave time today for um, for questions. Because according to this clock, we only have two minutes left. But that was a lot. So I hope you'll forgive me for, um, you know, dumping all that. But really, as I said, I hope that you keep, keep this three aspect thing first and foremost. Behavior, mind, understanding. And then, little by little, delve into each of these aspects. You know, uh, take one and, and study it and think about how it relates to your experience externally and internally, how it relates to your life, the way you live, and how it relates to your heart and mind and uh, your thoughts and the way you think and behave. Um, it's a it's a path that that is um, just so rich and, and really I mean this is what the Buddha taught is the way you know the way to the end of suffering I mean that's that's got a pretty appealing name to it you know the way to the end of suffering but we could also call it the way to happiness if that sounds better. Wow. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> so let's let's close. We'll do a little something to see to close. Let's just take you a moment to go inside and feel the breath. When the Buddha had his awakening, it said that he felt that what he had uncovered was too deep for most people to understand. But he came to realize that there would be some as it said, who had a little dust in their eyes. 
go out of the compassion for the world and the generations to come. He set out to teach this path. And we are the fortunate beneficiaries 2,600 years later. We are not just, though, the beneficiaries because engaging the Dharma comes with the responsibility to not waste this opportunity and to keep these teachings alive, to do our part, to keep the Dharma alive for this generation and the generations to come. May our practice together be of benefit to all beings. May all beings be free from suffering. All right, thank you. Thanks so much for not nodding off on talking. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back for one more one more week of this next week. <laughs>